Good evening, everyone. I'm Tony Paniagua, and welcome to AZ Illustrated Nature. Coming up next, tracking tortoises in the desert will tell you about a state program that is trying to get more information about these popular reptiles. Also, see some impressive images of the archaeological treasures in our region. They are part of an exhibit that is being curated by Archaeology Southwest. And meet a couple of successful young men who decided to drop out of the rat race and focus on a more minimalist way of life. But first, here's a look at tonight's headlines. Voters in Tucson Sunnyside School District have until 7 p.m. tomorrow to turn in ballots for the school board recall election. Incumbents Louis Gonzalez and Bobby Garcia face recall for supporting Superintendent Manuel Izquierdo. Eric Giffen is challenging Gonzalez, and Garcia has two opponents, Mike Pollock and Becky Quintero. Voting has been by mail, but election officials warn that mailing a ballot now will be too late. Instead, voters should take ballots to one of three places by 7 p.m. tomorrow. The list of places is at news.azpm.org. Arizonans could see utility bills decline when a Canadian corporation takes over Tucson Electric Power's parent company. Fortis Incorporated has agreed with the Arizona Corporation Commission to pay $30 million to lower utility costs. Tucson Electric officials say the payment is meant as an incentive to get state approval for Fortis to buy UNS Energy, owner of TEP. Pima County officials want public comment on the county's 10-year plan. Officials have concepts for the plan and need details for economic development, social services, infrastructure, and land use. County officials want infill in unincorporated suburban areas and to keep rural areas rural. The county will hold 10 public meetings starting this week. Dates, times, and places are at news.azpm.org. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Desert tortoises have adapted to extreme and challenging conditions over millions of years, but one of them is much more recent in the revolution, the environmental damages from human encroachment. Next, we learn about a tortoise tracking program near Phoenix that is gathering data about these reptiles. This story is an excerpt from Arizona Wildlife Views, a production of the Arizona Game and Fish Department, which airs every Sunday at noon on the UA Channel. The UA Channel is part of Arizona Public Media. Sonoran desert summers are bone dry and brittle, but then the greening begins. Monsoon rains refresh and revive, and the desert comes alive with people. People in search of desert tortoises that are finally on the move. Absolutely, as soon as the monsoons hit, tortoises start moving like crazy. It's prime time for desert tortoises to find the food and water they'll need to make it through the winter. It's also a golden opportunity for researchers like game and fish biologist Audrey Owens. The Sonoran desert tortoise is really understudied. Um, we don't know a whole lot about it, and that's pretty much by the virtue of the fact that they're so difficult to find. You know, they live in this habitat, um, and it's a really complex habitat. You've got boulders everywhere, um, and they don't make themselves known. They spend 90% of their lives underground in burrows. We're out here studying the juveniles, um, which is a, an, an age class that we really know little about. But that's about to change. Game and Fish is conducting a first-of-its-kind survey of juvenile tortoises like this one. A radio transmitter is attached to its shell so researchers can track its movements. And so we're looking at microhabitat use, we're looking at survival, we're looking at movement and home range. Well, I'm Justin. This I'm is, Alan. We're uh, interns for the Game and Fish Turtles project. And we basically just help Audrey and Christina come out and um, radio track the juvenile tortoises here. Once we find them, we take uh, GPS coordinates, elevation 721, okay. um, and then data on their habitat. And Alan can tell you about that. Yeah, every time we encounter a tortoise, um, we take weather, weather info, and basically what, what the tortoise is doing and what's around them. We try to get as much information as we can uh, at each encounter. With the juveniles, we had no idea that one so small would move so far. We Christina Jones is the Turtles Project coordinator. She says one juvenile tortoise surprised everyone by moving three kilometers in 34 days. Which is a 
a pretty big haul for a tortoise that was only 132 millimeters. We thought that it was when they reached a sub-adult stage, which is about 180 millimeters, that that's when they made their big movements. But now we're learning, we've had two of them that made pretty big movements just over a short period of time. And that's really exciting to know that, that it's the little guys that are, that are making, making the moves to find a different place to, to occupy. So far, researchers are radio tracking 14 juvenile tortoises thanks to the sharp eyes of hardworking volunteers. They are critical. Without the volunteers, uh, I think we would be tracking seven tortoises instead of 14 uh, with the juveniles. And also, they find, they find the adult. And I just want to first welcome you guys out here and thank you all for waking up before the crack of dawn to join us on our first survey of the year. So we've been monitoring the population here since 1991. That's when we marked our first tortoise. As of 2013, the Arizona Game and Fish Department has marked about 200 adult tortoises at this long-term study site located northeast of Phoenix. Um, and so we've gleaned a lot of information from the research that's been going on. The survival of adult tortoises is, is pretty high, about 97%. We've done research on the reproductive ecology of female tortoises. So take a look at this and get your search image. Again, you're not looking for movement because the adults tend to freeze when they see you. So we're looking for active tortoises. We're also looking for inactive tortoises. Anybody have any questions? After the briefing, volunteers go to work. So the majority of the tortoises that we come across are marked, but just about every year we come across at least one adult tortoise that's never been marked. A volunteer discovers the first tortoise hiding out in a burrow that gets a lot of use. It's a uh, burrow number 387. And that soil burrow has been used by, at least in the last 10 years, it's been used by eight different animals that I'm aware of. Christina goes in after it. It takes a little bit of work, but she finally manages to slide the tortoise out of its burrow. It is our first tortoise of the day. It's tortoise number 611. Uh, she is previously marked. We encounter her at least once up to three times a year. The first time she was captured, researchers gave her an ID number and filed notches into her shell. It's a code based on the marginal scoots of a tortoise shell that represent different numbers. By adding the numbers of the scoots that are notched, you get the tortoise's ID number, in this case, 611. It is a female tortoise. I don't know how long she's been in the study, uh, but I'm gonna guess that she was probably marked sometime in the last 12 years. Christina places 611 on a can, so she can't walk off while she's being processed. The, um, the guler scoots here, underneath the chin are what they use for fighting each other. Nearby, um, and Audrey does males, the same with tortoise well. number three. When we find a tortoise, we collect information on the habitats surrounding that tortoise. We also collect weather information, just basic temperature and humidity, uh, wind speed, cloud cover. And with that, we are hoping to be better informed on when tortoises are most active. And look at this, she's almost too big for my calipers. They also record a variety of other information about the tortoise, including its weight and size. 283. And then we're gonna do a health check on her real quick. Eyes, bright. Eyes are bright. Eyelids are normal. I always look at their, at their nostrils and I see if there's any um, exudate or snot, if you will, uh, or if they're clear. And if they are clear and if she is, has smooth breathing, then we can be fairly certain that she is not exhibiting any clinical signs of upper respiratory tract disease, which is not something that we have had documented at this site before. To minimize the chance of spreading disease from tortoise to tortoise, researchers wear latex gloves and disinfect all instruments that come in contact with the tortoise before moving on to the next one. As the morning progresses, the search continues. Danielle Shorts, an ASU biology student, is enjoying her volunteer experience. Yeah, I really want to work in conservation, so this was a really nice opportunity to kind of see what other people do in the same field. It was kind of nice to see that they were doing something like this, and I thought, well, this is a chance to see a tortoise out here in the desert, and thought it would be pretty cool. I'll go on the left side if you want to go on the right side. Okay. I love that my job is basically an adventure. I mean, I come out here, and I never know what I'm going to see. Rattlesnakes, Gila monsters, javelina, and even mountain lion tracks are all quite common. But an unmarked tortoise is the best find of all. Since this is a new one, we should probably take a picture. This will be tortoise number 673. Christina files the corresponding notches and applies a coat of clear epoxy over an ID number that's written on the shell. I just marked a new adult tortoise on the site. 
and uh, we come across maybe one or two a year, but as I mentioned, we've got 100, well now 195 tortoises marked here. And so that's really exciting to know that the amount of time we spend out here and we're still finding animals that are new to us. It's interesting to be able to see the same wild animals, you know, two, three times a week. It's been a lot of fun. So I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's the best job, <laughs> best job I've had. And so what we're doing now is reattaching the antenna of the transmitter here, just putting a, another dab of epoxy on top. After some minor repairs, this young tortoise joins the other juveniles that are making their monsoon moves. They just might be leading researchers to new discoveries that will help protect and conserve the Sonoran Desert Tortoise. Our desert southwest is famous for its wildlife, its geography, and its archaeology, and there are plenty of impressive pictures that capture some of this beauty. For this discussion, we are joined by Bill Doley, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest. The group is curating an exhibition at the Arizona State Museum here in Tucson. Bill, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Tony. Glad to be here. All right. We're going to talk about that exhibition, but first, a little bit about the organization. How long have you been around and what is its mission? Sure. Archaeology Southwest is based here in Tucson. We've been around over 30 years now. And we do what we call preservation archaeology. So we've got a dozen employees, um, most of them here in Tucson, one up in, in northwestern New Mexico. But preservation archaeology for us includes active research program, a effort to uh, reach out to the public and share the information from archaeological research. And we actually protect archaeological sites. We own several sites and we own hold conservation easements on others. So that's our, our mission there. Okay, well great. And then let's talk about this exhibition so we can show some pictures. The exhibition is called From Above, Images of a Storied Land. What would you like to say about the photographer behind uh, the photographs and where it's going to be seen and everything else? Yeah. We've had a long standing partnership with Adriel Heise, who's the photographer, and he flies his own airplane. He uh, actually steers the plane with a strap around his leg. He opens in, in the, all the images in the, uh, this uh, exhibit were taken in his old plane, which was, had no uh, protection, no windshield or anything. He was just out there uh, in what he calls calm air. Um, and he takes images off to the left. He can maneuver. This uh, plane has a stall speed of 35 miles an hour. It goes very slowly. And he has a tremendous eye. Uh, for landscape, for the impact of past humans on that landscape, and he's, he's assembled a wonderful por portfolio. And what do you like about the fact that these are images from above? Obviously a bird's eye view, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, for these places, right? Yes. I mean, Adriel sort of cap in, uh, captures his um, mission as he flies for the wonder of it, and he photographs for uh, the understanding that comes from it. And I think that, I mean, going up to a high place and looking down really gives you a feel for that larger landscape that you're part of. And this really has helped. <clears throat> we put out a, a quarterly magazine, and we've used well over 100 of Adriel's images in that, for example. And his ability to, to help tell the story of what uh, people of the past uh, left behind on, on these landscapes. All right, and some of these places may be very recognizable to some of our audience here. Let's talk about uh, Tumamak Hill, that photograph, that image. What would you like to say about that one? Well, Tumamak Hill is now open to public access and a lot of people go up there and visit this place. I think one of the th stories about Tumamak Hill is the number of layers uh, that are even e evident on the top of the hill. And there's these massive enclosing walls that were built in the past. And it also uh, highlights the fragility of archaeological resources. We've gone on top of that hill and built all these communication towers as well. So these, there's the natural vegetation, the saguaros, and, and these walls that are on the, on the hill slope there. And then there's these mechanical uh, intrusions on that landscape. So the story of how modern people interact with the landscapes of the past, I think, comes out in that. What would you like to say about Las Capas? Las Capas tells another really important story. It's right here in Tucson. Uh, it's it's the, where Ina Road intersects I-10. I There's a, a truck trailer, a uh, double trailer uh, truck uh, coming south towards Tucson, and right next to it is an active excavation. 
in the middle of that excavation is an irrigation canal about 3,000 years old. So and, early farmers here in Tucson. And briefly, Chaco Canyon, the third picture. Chaco is another place that people are fascinated by. It's a remote place with magnificent architecture. And Adriel's photo of, of uh, Chetraketal, one of the big uh, villages out there, it almost looks like a natural feature and almost a volcano erupting out there. And, and I think people will really appreciate that landscape when they uh, see his image. All right, Bill, and where, once again, is the exhibit and for how long? Well, the Arizona State Museum, uh, the, the, uh, right there at the, on the north uh, side of the university entrance is uh, the place, and it's there until September 20, 20th, I believe. September 20th. Okay, well, Bill Doley, thank you very much for joining us, and good luck with uh, Archaeology Southwest. Thanks, Tony. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, a conversation with Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren about her new book, A Fighting Chance. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. The Soviet government changed everything about the way Russians lived, including what they ate. Choices for this or that food, the tastings, took place at the Politburo level. The kinds of candies that began to be mass produced was decided on a special meeting with Stalin and Molotov. I'm Renee Montaigne, inside Soviet Russia's communal kitchens on the next morning edition from NPR News. Two young successful men who are working in the corporate world are embracing a very different kind of lifestyle, and it has taken them to different countries and cities around the world. Now they are known as the minimalists, and they are spreading their message to millions of people. We spoke to them during their recent stop in Tucson. Ryan Nicodemus and Joshua Milburn, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for, having, for us. having us. All right, so let's begin with the conversation about how you drastically changed your lives. It didn't happen all of a sudden, but it happened gradually. Uh, Ryan, let's begin with you. What was going on in your life, and then what happened next? So I had got to a point in my life where I didn't know what was important. I had all this stuff. I had this great job, a fancy new car every couple of years, a nice big 2,000 square foot condo, but I wasn't happy. And it's really funny, because if you would have told my 18-year-old self what my 28-year-old self was going to have, I would have been the most excited 18-year-old. But it took getting everything I ever wanted to realize it's not really what I wanted at all. You know, at 18, I thought that stuff would bring me happiness, it would bring me joy, but it really brought me the opposite. It brought me debt, it brought me anxiety, it brought me stress. I was miserable. I was working 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours a week, and I forsook the most important things in my life. I never thought about my health or my relationships or things that I was passionate about or growing or contributing. So I was kind of lost. And I noticed something different uh, as I was approaching age 30 about my best friend of 20 something years. Josh was really, really happy, just ecstatic. So I did what any good best friend would do. I took Josh out to lunch. Uh, we uh, went to a little diner and um, I sat him down and while we were eating, I asked him a question. Why the heck are you so happy? And he spent the next 20 minutes telling me about this thing called minimalism. Five years ago, my entire life was radically different. By age 27, I was the youngest director in my company's 140-year history. I managed 150 retail stores, and I was ostensibly successful, but I didn't feel successful. Much like Ryan, I, I, did, I felt anxious. I felt overwhelmed by life. And then my mother died, my marriage ended, both in the same month. And I realized, I looked around all the stuff that was in my life, all the things that I had put so much focus on accumulating and accumulating the status that I realized that I wasn't focused on the most important things in life. And across the internet, I fell down that beautiful rabbit hole of the internet. I, I found this thing called minimalism. And I found all these different people, all these different flavors of minimalism. And so I spent about eight months really paring down my, uh, my life, getting rid of about 90% 90, 90 of my possessions. And Ryan, you had a really good example of how you did it and perhaps a, a sample of how other people might follow suit as well. Yeah, so after Josh introduced me to that entire community of people that he just mentioned, I thought to myself, okay, this sounds like something I, I could use in my life to gain a different perspective. I'll do it, I'll be a minimalist. So I look up at Josh, I'm like, all right, man, I'm in, I'm a minimalist. 
now what? <laughs> you know, I, I didn't want to spend months paring down my items like Josh had. I'm a more results-driven guy. I wanted faster results. So we came up with this idea called a packing party where we decided to pack all my belongings in my 2,000 square foot condo as if I were moving. And then I would unpack things as I needed it over the next three weeks. So Josh literally helped me box up everything. My clothes, my kitchenware, my towels, my electronics, my TVs, my frame photographs and paintings, my toiletries, even my furniture. We literally pretended like I was moving. So after about nine hours and a couple pizza deliveries, everything was packed and everything was just sitting there in my second living room. I have no idea why a single guy needs two living rooms, but I, uh, uh, I was sitting there faced with all my stuff, just boxes stacked on top of boxes, stacked on top of boxes. Each box was labeled really well, so I would know where to go. Um, labels like living room, junk drawer number one, bedroom, closet, kitchenware, junk drawer number five. And I unpacked things as I needed it over the next 21 days. So you can imagine that first night, I unpacked my toothbrush, my bed and bed sheets, some clothes for work. The next day I unpacked the internet, I unpacked the furniture I actually used, and I continued this for 21 days. At the end of those three weeks, I had 80% of my stuff still left in those boxes, just sitting there, unaccessed. You know, I looked at those boxes and I couldn't even remember what was in most of them. So I donated and I sold all of it. And that's really where our website, theminimalists.com started, was with that packing party, with that story. All right, and Joshua, what is your message, uh, if you will, to the people that you're speaking to? You're touring many, many cities in different countries. Right. What is the bottom line, if there is a bottom line? The bottom line is pretty simple for me. It's love people and use things, because the opposite never works. So you were saying, we were speaking earlier, that you're not against buying items. Right. But it's also how you put it all in perspective in your life? Yeah, I'm not against consumption. I think we all need some stuff. It's just like I'm not against working a job. We all have to pay the bills. The problem for me was compulsory consumption. I was buying things because that's what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to have these certain things in order to uh, attain a certain status or a, a certain identity that I had wrapped it up into my material possessions. So Ryan, you guys were making pretty good money before you yeah. took this road to minimalism. A lot of people in their 20s or 30s are now trying to make as much money as they can. They're trying to get that great job. Is there, is there a juxtaposition here? I mean, can they go hand in hand or how do you explain it? How would you recommend that they move forward with their lives? Well, you know, I remember when I graduated high school, I thought to myself, if I can make $50,000 a year, I'll be happy. And after I started climbing the corporate ladder in my early 20s, I quickly began earning 50 grand. But I didn't feel rich. So I had to go back to the drawing board and I thought to myself, I didn't adjust for inflation. So maybe $65,000 a year is rich, maybe 90,000, maybe six figures. The problem was, is every time I made more money, I spent even better money. So when I made $90,000 a year, I was spending $110,000 a year. And then when I made $130,000 a year, I was spending $150,000 a year. And that equation never works. So I would say to someone who is looking to get a high paying job just to be deliberate with the way they spend their money and stay out of debt and only consume what they need. Okay, and Joshua, you are touring the country with the book that you both yeah. wrote. So what do you want to tell us about this book? Well, everything that remains is sort of our story from these suit and tie corporate guys to becoming a couple of minimalists. And it's not a how-to book, it's more of a why-to book. We wanted to tell our stories with this book, but we really wanted to help people bridge the gap from a discontented life to a more meaningful life. Good effects for the environment are def definitely part of that. If you consume less, then you're throwing away less, less of a carbon footprint that you have, for sure. And, and then long term, what do you think? Do you think this is going to spread, uh, Joshua, or do you think it's just going to be a few people, a minimal amount of people that are being minimalists. <laughs> it's interesting, when, when Ryan and I first came up with the idea to start our website, I remember the first month, 52 people visited our website, and it was this amazing feeling, because I mean, our, we weren't crazy, right? At least 52 other people found value in this message, and pretty soon, that 52 turned into 500, 
500 became 5,000, and last year more than 2 million people visited our website. It keeps growing, and we find that the demographic is anyone with an open mind. We had an 11-year-old bring his father in Albuquerque. We had an 83-year-old great-grandmother bring four generations of her family in St. Louis. We've had CEOs and Occupy Wall Street folks show up at the same event. And what I'm finding is that this message is applicable to anyone who wants to live more deliberately. All right, uh, Ryan, closing words? Um, if I had to say anything, I would just echo what, what Josh said earlier about loving people uh, and using things. All right. Well, Ryan Nicodemus and Joshua Milburn, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Next, you'll learn about one of the interesting creatures that lives in our region. This segment is part of a series of short films by the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. The programs are called Desert Discovery, and they feature the plants and animals that surround us. Here has been the King from the museum. Brenda King with the Arizona Sonora Desert Museum. Today I'd like to introduce you to one of the largest lizards found in the Sonoran Desert, the San Esteban Island Chuckwalla. Now you might look at this lizard and think, well she doesn't look that large. Well this is a youngster, she's only six years old, and when she's full grown she'll be about two feet long. As her name suggests, she's found on the San Esteban Island, which is an island located in the Gulf of California or the Sea of Cortez. This island is not inhabited by people. It's rather rocky, kind of desolate, and that's just the ideal habitat for her. In the morning, she's gonna wake up and go out onto one of the rocks and bask in the sunlight to warm her body up. She is an ectotherm or cold-blooded, so she can't really get moving around a whole lot until her body temperature gets to be well over 100 degrees. She's gonna bask in the sun, get all warm, and then she's going to go out and look for food. You might think that a lizard that looks like this would be a meat eater, but she's not. She likes to eat plants, so leaves and flowers, buds, fruit, whatever she can find, and on occasion she will eat an insect. Now look at these really long toes and long nails. These help her in her defense. One of her predators might be a hawk, and if a hawk should spot her on the island, she has a very unique defense. First, she's going to run, and these toenails help her to grab onto the rocks, and she's going to race into a crevice, and she'll puff herself up. She will inflate her lungs with air and more or less wedge herself into the rock, making it impossible for a predator to pull her out. Now, one of the things about San Esteban Ch Island chuckwallas is that they are an endangered species. These animals have been collected for the pet trade. Because she lives on an island, anything that happens on that island can affect the population and invasive or introduced species have affected their population as well. So hopefully if you're ever down in the Sea of Cortez, you can stop off on San Esteban Island and get a look at one of these gorgeous San Esteban Island chuckwallas. Thank you. That's our show. To keep up with the latest news or to watch the segments from this or any other editions of AZ Illustrated, you may visit our website at news.azpm.org. I'm Tony Paniagua. Thanks for watching.